All right, guys. This is chapter four, or excuse me, twenty-four, the Progressive Era. The first thing I would do is go to the website and look at the student notes that are going to be, I think, right here. All right. Um, when you look at those, make sure to notice that there's going to be videos that I put in the presentation that don't end up playing. So you need to play them from the notes. If I was you, I would open up two screens and take notes while you're listening to this and watching it. Okay, the Progressive Era, 1890 to 1917. A lot of this stuff comes out of uh, a need for urban societies to deal with the new problems that they have of industrialization and urbanization and political bosses and all that sort of stuff. So even as it says right there, progressivism is an umbrella labeled for a wide range of economic, political, and social and moral reforms. These include efforts to outlaw sale of alcohol, regulate child labor, sweatshops, scientifically managed natural resources, ensure pure and wholesome water, uh, and milk Americanized immigrants or restrict immigration altogether, and bust or regulate trusts. All of that stuff is stuff we talked about in previous chapters. So what happens here is this is like a reaction to all of that other stuff, all right? So you can see in the picture there, we got Teddy Roosevelt, we got kids working, and we have the uh, stuff of the government there trying to um, change stuff with the prohibition picture. Now, the elements of reform. Your textbook, there's a quote in there that says, real heart, the real heart of the movement declared on declared one reformer was to use the government as an agency for human welfare. Now, that's the idea here. Um, it's not quite like liberalism like we think of today when we think of Democrats and stuff like that, but it's along those same lines. Uh, the government is going to take active steps to limit business or to uh, make sure people are eating you know, safe meat or whatever. Okay, So an example your textbook gives is uh, the outrash, like outcry for public services. Um, starting with cyclists and eventually people with motor cars, uh, the need for good roads. And you can remember that from Devil in the White City, how it talked about how roads in the poor parts of town weren't very good. And so they get after making those roads to help everyone out. Uh, the antecedents of progressivism uh, grew as a response to the problems of industrialization and urbanization, as we said. But most Americans weren't, weren't going to go as far as, say, socialism. And they didn't want to go as far as, say, laissez-faire economics, where there was just everything left alone. There was something in the middle, okay, something, and that was what the progressive era was really kind of all about. Now, the muckrakers and muckraking come out of a uh, need to address these sort of difficult issues. Um, it leads to a sort of investigative journalism, okay, I think uh, 60 Minutes, 2020, that kind of stuff today. But these muckrakers um, were journalists that shined a light on monopolies and all those sorts of problems, okay? Um, <clears throat> as it said in your book, they were useful to society, but if they went too far, they became counterproductive and they just were kind of stirring up problems. There's a quote in there from Teddy Roosevelt talking about how they were good, but only to a point, all right? A good example of one of these muckrakers was Henry uh, Damaris Lloyd, who was one of the first who wrote Wealth Against Commonwealth, and it was a critical examination of monopolies, and namely Standard Oil, right? And as you remember... Uh, Standard Oil, when we talked about Rockefeller, how he sort of intimidated people into doing what he wanted, and then once he intimidated, he took over their businesses, limiting competition, meaning he could charge the prices, kind of like when we gave you that example in class. <clears throat> other books went on to talk about other problems, and we'll talk about The Jungle here in a little bit of by Umpton Sinclair. And again, all of this stuff is, if we looked back at the last chapter with the ideas of realism, they were moving away from everything's going to be in rosy to looking at the more true picture of what we had going on. Features of progressivism, democracy, efficiency, regulation, and social justice. Um, all of these play a big role in making really the modern, modern version of America. So, democracy... Democracy's big movement during this time is going to be the actual the use of the direct primary. Okay, the way the president and most sort of things are selected nowadays is through a primary system. There's like a vote before the major vote, where a party will select its nominee. Well, back in the day, these 
these parties weren't actually electing their nominees. If you remember, we talked about local politics being more important than national politics. In the Gilded Age, it was because the party boss or the political bosses, like Boss Tweed and stuff like that, had so much sway that they could basically pick anybody they wanted to. So these <clears throat> primaries were more of a grassroots, community-based type thing. So you could get the people you wanted elected to be in office. Okay. Uh, they started in South Carolina in 1896, and a few decades later, most of the states had them. Okay, they began to also use other things like the recall, uh, voter registration bills, and all that sort of stuff. Recalls aren't really popular in Texas, but they are popular in other places. Uh, you might remember, you know, maybe a little bit before your time, but a few years back, California paid a lot of money for uh, energy, and in paying all that money for energy, they got pissed off and recalled their elect recalled their governor and eventually replaced him with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Another sort of interesting thing out of this was uh, the commissioner system, which we will see, I think, in a little bit. But the commissioner system w was an idea that started in Galveston uh, also during this time period. And this commissioner idea was you set, you made commissioners that were in charge of different things to take care of stuff. But I guess that's more local politics. And we'll talk about that more when we get to uh, efficiency, which is the next slide. So the efficiency stuff. Okay, the efficiency stuff is kind of interesting, and I was all excited because I thought I was going to have a story that wasn't in the book, but then it was in the book, and you'll read about him. A guy named Frederick Taylor uh, had these ideas for scientific management, and what would happen is, back in the day, if you went to work, you would just go in and do your job, and there wasn't really a lot of oversight or thought about how people did their work. And so Frederick Taylor began to measure things, okay, and began to think about how people worked and the jobs they did and stuff like that. And the classical example was, is he went into this, I want to say it was a a steel company, and he wanted to figure out why certain days of the week they had, you know, problems making enough steel. And uh, one of the things that, just as a side note, before Prohibition, people drank so much on the weekends that they really didn't expect people to be very uh, productive on Mondays was kind of an interesting thing, but that's kind of beside the point. Um, another thing was that uh, he, he realized, old Frederick Taylor did, was that Everybody had their own type of shovel, and so if you think about it, if I came in and I had a sh snow shovel, and you know, <clears throat> Mr. Fryer came in and he had a, a gardening spade, you know, who would do more work? So he, what he did was he standardized the size of the shovel. Also, he he put into other things about how much energy was used to shovel stuff and all that sort of stuff. But what he did was he standardized it and took a scientific approach to measuring how much work people did and finding the most efficient way of using it. Now, there are going to be some other stuff that comes up, um, you know, especially in legislation and stuff like that. There's going to be a guy, guy by the name of Robert La Follette, or La Follet, uh, the governor of Wisconsin, fighting Bob, as they called him. What he did was he established legislative bureaus, or legis the Legislative Reference Bureau, which would basically give business and uh, legislators and, and government a place to go to find basically like information. So today, a lot of this is done in universities. You, get, you go look up a study to figure out what's going to be the best way to do something. And then that study then influences leaders to make decisions. Um, as I said, the, the uh, commission system also was during this time period in Galveston was where that started. Um, and next, that takes us to regulation. So we talked about the trust in the previous chapters. These giant corporations that had a lot of different things underneath them, or a lot of other companies underneath them, which limited competition. Remember the whole uh, laissez-faire idea, that if we left everything alone, that it would work out the best for society. The social Darwinism idea, all that sort of stuff. And that's not really the case for how it works, because they figured out that people can limit competition and limit things by it being left alone. So, you know... In regulating the government, it actually made huge steps, and this is kind of one of the big things about the progressive era, is the huge steps that it makes uh, come at the come at really a change of point of view. Uh, first, if you remember back in previous sections and chapters, the presidents were kind of so-so because they didn't really do anything. They thought it was Congress's job to make laws, and they just sort of enforced them as they saw fit. Right, So the last like four or five presidents since Abraham Lincoln have been kind of duds. So Teddy Roosevelt gets in the office, and he actually wants to be a proactive president. He, he becomes a trust buster, is what he's referred to as. Um, 
Also, there was another problem that they faced was that the Supreme Court basically said that states and governments couldn't regulate business because the only thing in the Constitution said was that it could regulate interstate business. And so interstate business was the only thing that would come up. And so really it took Teddy Roosevelt to come on board to change a lot of that stuff. And so if you can see there in the pictures, you have Teddy Roosevelt with the bad trust and the good trust. And he actually drew a line between those. He thought th some trusts were good because they would help uh, fledgling businesses. Uh, you know, if you have a business that's just getting off the ground and it doesn't really have a chance to, you know, if competition with, say, older technologies would screw it up. Like, think of green energy today, right? If if you made green energy go off, go face-to-face -face with, say, traditional energy, well, traditional energy has a better infrastructure, it's going to be cheaper, so it's always going to win. So what does the government do? The government gives people initiatives and money to make sure that it can compete, all right? And so if you if you we could form like one major company that could you know find green energy or electric cars or whatever it is that one one company might be better than multiple companies okay and then the bad trust would be trust like say standard oil in the picture down there that you know don't allow competition <clears throat> next it's going to be social justice you can see there's a link here for a video on, from the history channel it's like 2 minutes long included in the notes on the website, all right, so go take a look at that. Um, it's, you know, it's not the best video in the world, but there will be a question or two from it, so you make, make sure you go look at it. Other stuff with, with social justice, okay, social justice should be one of those things that, you know, going to a Jesuit high school, we should actually take a good look at, because, you know, what happened is, is we had all this progress, you know, economically and socially, maybe not socially, but, uh, you know, monetarily, uh, industry-wise, you know, expansion, imperialism, all that sort of stuff going on. But what cost did we have? You know, did people have to live in crappy houses and, you know, face disease and have horrible work hours and all that sort of stuff? And the answer is yes. And so it took a movement in our society to, to fight against that, which was pretty, it's pretty unique to the United States. As I've talked about before, this era reminds me a lot of what goes on in third world countries. Um, it's the progressive era that puts us on the road to, to what we are today, all right? So social justice comes along, ideas of, of people and the government helping those less fortunate. It's the antithesis of social Darwinism. Um, it begins to manifest itself in formation of charities. Uh, you have sanitation reformers that go out to raise awareness for uh, hygiene in cities uh, so that people don't get sick. You also have awareness campaigns for things against child labor, as I saw in the video earlier. Uh, also, uh, people against the consumption of alcohol, the prohibitionists, okay? Uh, in the picture there, you can see people from the Anti-Saloon League, uh, a lady by the name of, oh, what's her name? Where did I write that down? Just, just, Carrie Nation, right there with her hatchet. She used to get fired up and go into these saloons and basically uh, destroy, you know, bottles and stuff like that and cause a big hoopla to get raise awareness of the problem that the saloon caused. Now, I know Prohibition, your high school boys, you don't maybe see the need for it and why they passed it. But what happened is, is people during this time period lived in such sort of dreary times. They would go drink. They would spend too much money. Their parents, you know, kids would go poor, all that sort of stuff. Our kids would go out f without food. And so... Prohibition ends up being a big thing, a big, mainly a big women's fight, but not all only a women's fight. You can see there in the top picture, uh, it was also a religious thing that was going as well. Uh, now, other things during this social justice idea of the progressive era, the idea of the settlement house movement. I should have put a picture in there, but I didn't, of Jane Addams and Hull House, as we read about in Devil in the White City. She set up the house for, uh, you know, people on the, you know, women that were struggling, uh, homeless people, all that sort of stuff. Also during this time period, there's going to be a movement for improving prisons. Um, there's going to be uh, a thing for the mentally ill. All that sort of stuff gets going during this time period. Now, back to the prohibition stuff, because I can see it in my notes here. You get the Women's Christian Temperance Union, set it up by Frances Willard. It ends up being the largest women's group ever created. It's going to be anti-saloon, pro-improvement to prisons, uh, they're going to set up houses for help abused women, and they're going to push them for women's suffrage. Now, women's suffrage is going to be a big issue through the progressive era, and it's not going to be kind of accepted towards till towards the end. Um, and eventually, uh, all these private groups give way to government involvement. 
Um, so you see some Supreme Court cases that kind of go back and forth, forth with this. You get Locke versus New York in 1905, which basically said that the 10-hour workday was unconstitutional because it was against this uh, contract that the two sides would agree on. But then, you know, three years later in Muller v. Oregon, uh, the Supreme Court upheld the 10-hour workday because the the whole re reasoning w was with this fake science that said that if women worked more than 10 hours, they wouldn't be able to bear children and lead them to do immoral things and all that sort of stuff. But the Supreme Court used it as as a reason to have a 10-hour workday. Now, for you and I, 10 hours sounds like a long day, but in actuality, this was this was a, an idea of having a 10-hour workday, limiting it from, say, like 12 or 18 or whatever. Also on this, make sure you go check the video out on Prohibition. Yet again, it's another two or three minute video from the History Channel. Now, Roosevelt's progressivism. All right? Roosevelt uh, wanted the expanded view of the presidency, as I was pointing out. He wanted to be proactive. He did not want to let Congress make decisions. He wanted to use the office to its fullest extent, yet again, like Abraham Lincoln, all right? And so Roosevelt's thing is going to be the square deal. You know, you might have heard of, uh, you know, his cousin FDR and the New Deal. Uh, Roosevelt is going to have the square deal, all right? And the, the basic ideas of it, what they call the three C's, the conservation of natural resources, the control of corporations, and consumer protection. All of those things are clearly aimed at the middle class, and the progressive era is really a time when the middle class was kind of flexing its muscle, right, and, and moving society forward. The conservation of natural resources, meaning that, you know, the businesses and, and corporations wouldn't be able to, like, you know, cut down all the forests and all that sort of stuff. The control of corporations, meaning breaking up trust and regulating business. And then lastly, consumer protection, as we'll see things like the FDA, uh, all that sort of stuff to help protect people from bad business practices of selling, like, bad meat or stuff like that. <clears throat> so, FDR and his square deal, as I just mentioned. Uh, the first thing we get out of it is the Pure Food and Drug Act, which leads us to the FDA, right? The FDA and uh, all of that stuff was a big push coming out of Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, all right? The Jungle is a story about, yet again... 19, early 1900s, late 1800s, Chicago, and this immigrant family who shows up and has to work these horrible, you know, 16-hour days in a meatpacking plant, and how, you know, there's kids getting limbs cut off and ground up, put into food, and it's just this very sad, you know, horrible image of this business, and what it does is make sure that legislation like the Pure Food and Drug Act gets passed. <clears throat> which eventually leads to the FDA and the Meat Inspection Act and is good for everybody. So, yet again, you know, art affecting society. Sinclair's The Jungle, kind of like uh, Beecher Stowe's Uncle Top's Cabin, that kind of thing. Now, <clears throat> what else do we got here? So, yet again, our boy Teddy, he looked at trust as either good or bad, and so you'll notice the funky sugar-looking deal right here. Um... What this leads to is some Supreme Court cases, uh, namely ones that dealt with the Sherman Antitrust Act. The Sherman Antitrust Act, is, is, it doesn't say, but I'll read it to you, is an attempt to curb concentrations of economic power that significantly reduced competition between businesses. One of its two main provisions outlawed all trade combination or agreements that restricted trade between states or with foreign powers, namely trusts. The second outlawed any attempt to monopolize trade within the United States. Also trusts. When, a, uh, when the American Sugar Refining Company acquired almost all of the sugar producing capacity in the U.S., the government sought to divest, its, divest it of its monopoly. So what happens is the E.C. Knight Company buys up all of the sugar producing plants. And so they, they owned like 99% of the plants that could produce sugar. And the Supreme Court actually ruled in favor of them when the government tried to break them up because they ruled that the production of a, com a commodity or a good wasn't quite the same as uh, a business working across state lines. Because 
that would have been an intrastate thing, like across a state, not across multiple states. So if you, you had the production of everything, that was fine. But if you owned the actual sell of it, sale of everything, that wasn't fine. So as long as your sugar company produced it all, then sold it to somebody else who sold it or you know retailed it, however you want to think about it, that was fine. Other trusts weren't so good. So like Standard Oil is a good example. Standard Oil gets broken up um, by the Elkins Act, which we'll see here in a minute or two. Uh, but it gets broken up into other com companies. And there's a lot of things you can look up about trusts and how they're bad and all that sort of stuff. Eventually we'll talk about rebates for the railroad and how that gets thrown out as well. But that idea also, yet again, was a anti-competition thing they had going on that the government had to break up so that competition could occur, which is better for all of us. Yet again, the example I gave you guys in class, uh, you know, about producing Coca-Cola or whatever it was. Now, one of the best stories about Teddy Roosevelt, though, here, deals with the 1902 coal strike. Okay, These coal miners in West Virginia striked because uh, their boss, the mining company, I forget what it was called, wouldn't, they wanted better working conditions and better hours and all that sort of stuff, and the mining company wasn't going to do it, so they went on strike. Well, traditionally, as we've read, the way they dealt with this is they sent in the Pinkerton detectives and they break the strikes and they force the guys to go back to work. That was how they used to deal with it. Now you got Teddy Roosevelt in office. Teddy Roosevelt doesn't play that way. So what happens is, is as it gets closer and closer into winter, or gets further and further into winter, excuse me, gets colder and colder. So the need for coal to heat the homes becomes a bigger deal. And Roosevelt realized that it would have been basically on his plate if the people people started to die because of freezing and stuff like that. So what he does is he invites both of the groups to the White House. And he offers them an opportunity to kind of hash out their problems. The issue is is that they don't they don't hash it out and they, they basically make a farce of his meeting, which pisses him off. So he gets up and basically tells them that if they don't get in there and mine the coal, he's gonna send the army in to mine the coal for the American people and that nobody's gonna make any money off of it. And this gets the mining company uh it gets their attention and they basically come to the bargaining table and give the miners a little bit better stuff so that they can actually get in there, like shorter days, shorter working hours, that sort of stuff. And uh, they get in there to mine the coal and they get after it. Now, this isn't going to be something that like becomes a standard, like the government, like in theory, the constitutionality of a, the president sending in the army to run something uh, is pretty unconstitutional. And uh, Harry, uh, Harry Truman threatens to do that as well uh, in the 1950s during the Korean War because he's saying that they need more steel and so he's going to say, he says that if the steel companies don't open up more steel plants or quit closing plants or whatever it was, he was going to send them in the army and he actually, that actually goes to the Supreme Court and it's found unconstitutional and he couldn't do it. <clears throat> now, uh, yet again, the expanding government ideas, uh, you know, right, yet again, the idea of Roosevelt, the presidency, the government all itself being more proactive to help citizens. Uh, you get the Elkins Act, as I was mentioning earlier, to halt uh, rebates. Okay, These railroad rebates. Yet again, the Elkins Act over here. Uh, there's a cartoon on it that says the bill that was easy. Uh, without getting too much into it, what happens is these railroad companies would give their favorite people rebates. So think about it this way, it was, it's like charging people different prices, and if you ever want to get me off topic, ask me about, uh, uh, oh, I forget, it's called like price fixing or price recognition or something like that, I love to talk about it, but uh, what happens is, is like if I had somebody that rode my, you know, my railroad all the time, I could give them rebates. What they did was this was unfair practices, they could charge their competitors more and give other guys less, and it ended up causing fraud amongst the railroad, and this was a big public outcry that they had to pass this stuff, and so the Hepburn Act, or excuse me, not the, Hepburn, the Elkins Act puts an end to that. Also during this time period, uh, you get the creation of the Department of Commerce and Labor, which yet again creates the Corporation Bureau or something like that, which also goes out of its way to break up these trusts and anti-competition thing. This is when Standard Oil gets broken up into all its subsidiary companies, which is ironic because one of them becomes Exxon. Uh, also, the American Tobacco Company, uh, in you know, owned by uh, Duke, uh, gets yet again broken up and turned into several other companies. Now, 
TR's second term here. Remember that his first term, he served after the death of McKinley uh, following his assassination. And so his second term, he's going to get uh, elected in a pretty big landslide. Uh, there's a guy named Alton Parker who was the, I believe, governor of New York, uh, or Supreme Court justice in New York, from the state Supreme Court for them. Uh, he carries the South because uh, Democrats are big in the South and whatnot. But for the most part, Teddy Roosevelt was incredibly popular and defeated him in his election. Uh, I'm not sure. I think I might have put the link to the election website. If not, feel free to go to the election of 1904, whatever it is, or 1908, off of the one I did put on there. Um, what's going to happen is... Uh, at the beginning of his second term, he's going to say, no, I'm not going to run for another term, the whole, like, uh, you know, George Washington two-term deal. But he's going to regret that because he does come back to run again. Uh, so legislative leadership, right? Yet again, this idea of uh, the president setting the tone right? and setting the agenda for the country. And Roosevelt, yet again, was big on the three C's as we talked about earlier, the, you know, conservation, consumer stuff, uh, what was the other, what was the third one, and the control of corporations. So that's still going to be the, the same ideas, all right? So they're going to pass the Hepburn Act in 1906. Hepburn Act is going to make the Interstate Commerce Commission, or the ICC, all right? <clears throat> and it gives it the power to set maximum railroad rates in extended jurisdiction. This led to the discontinuation of free passes to loyal shippers. In addition, the ICC would view the railroad's financial records, a task simplified by standardized bookkeeping for any railroad that was resisted. The ICC conditions would remain in effect until outcome and legislation. The Corporation Bureau, or whatever it is that he set up earlier, that was what happened with Standard Oil. They wouldn't give their books up, and so they broke them up. Um... Uh, the other big thing, and we're probably one of the things that Teddy Roosevelt's the most known for, is his conservation. Okay, There was a myth at the time that the United States or America in general had these in inexhaustible resources, and so we could just kind of take and take and take and take, and nothing would ever go away. Uh, clearly, we know that's not true. Um, and so you see during this time period things like the Audubon Society to protect endangered birds and the Boone and Crockett Club set up by Teddy Roosevelt and his buddies to to save big game animals and all that sort of stuff are going to be created. Also, Teddy Roosevelt is going to pass legislation that's going to set aside land for national parks. So think Yellowstone National Park and parts of Wyoming and all that sort of stuff. And then the Grand Canyon National Park. All of those are places that no one can, like, touch. Like, imagine if, if they hadn't set that stuff aside and, you know, people were building hotels and all sorts of stuff out there. We wouldn't have the natural beauty that we did at the time. Now, kind of one of the interesting things is Teddy Roosevelt, you know, he wasn't like a, a romantic when it came to the ideas of conservation. He he wasn't trying to be like a like the Sierra Club or uh, I'm trying to think of all the, you know, uh, Greenpeace or anything like that. Uh, what he wanted to do was he wanted to make rules to limit how businesses used resources. So, like, timber companies couldn't just, like, cut down all the trees they wanted kind of thing. Now, he wanted to set aside land because he, he appreciated it, but he wasn't, you know, the kind of like a tree hugger kind of idea, I guess is what I'm getting at. Now, <clears throat> what he's going to do is he's going to set up the division of the forestry in 1885. Or excuse me, that's when it would have been uh, been set up, not by him. Uh, and then eventually that turns into today what we have the U.S. Forest Service. You might, you know, think of Smokey the Bear or something like that. Um, and what he's going to do is sit a guy by the name of Ginf Gifford P Pinchot to head it up. And him and Pichot are going to basically create all these things like the Forest Reserve Act, uh, which is going to limit the sale of land to corporations. Right? Teddy Roosevelt talks about how he doesn't have respect for men that skin the land or something like that. Um, but what that does is, yet again, set up rules for how corporations can use the land. All right? From Roosevelt to Taft. Okay, Roosevelt and Taft had distinctly different views. Okay, Roosevelt had that new progressive view that we talked about, that he was going to be proactive. He was going to make, make decisions and influence what society did. Howard Taft isn't. Howard Taft really doesn't have the same mindset. Um, he's not the same kind of person as uh, Teddy Roosevelt. He's going to have the, more of an idea of like a referee. 
the more traditional idea of how government was supposed to work, not to get involved, but sort of kind of sit off to the side and contemplate stuff, all right? So, you know, Taft is going to kind of have a very long political career. Uh, in the end, after he's president, he's eventually going to be the chief justice of the Supreme Court for a few years. So he wasn't like an incompetent guy. He just maybe isn't as popular as Roosevelt. He was a large guy, so he kind of gets made fun of because of that and all the cartoons and stuff like that. Um, but he, yet again, had just more laissez-faire ideas for government and or economics. Now, one of the things that happens is Taft appoints a guy by the name of <clears throat> Richard Ballinger, the Secretary of the Interior. And Ballinger is going to sell land in Alaska that's going to have coal in it to a group of men uh, that then in turn sell it to a mining syndicate. And Pinchot, the guy that uh, Roosevelt had put in charge of the Forestry Service, is going to see this as underhanded and basically going against the spirit of all the things that him and Teddy Roosevelt had put together. So he's going to cause a big hoopla and have public awareness, and it's going to go to the courts about being, see if it was corrupt and all that sort of stuff, and eventually the courts find that it wasn't, and Taft actually fires him. Uh, and when Taft fires him, this kind of sets a, a public tone that Taft really isn't Teddy Roosevelt, and that it kind of sullies the opinion's view of Taft. Now, this leads us to the Taft versus Roosevelt uh, bullet there, and the interesting thing was, is, is after Roosevelt had left office, he actually went on this, like, safari expedition type thing into Africa, and there's this, like, image that's portrayed that he sort of reappears in Africa, finding about out about how Taft is sort of undoing all the stuff that he did and, you know, rushes back to the United States as soon as he can to run this new progressive campaign against the Republicans and the Democrats, for that matter, uh, to be reelected for president. Uh, if that's the way that it happened, I don't know. But the idea was that he kind of got word in Africa and came back. Uh, but who knows? Now, what ends up happening... <clears throat> with the election of 1912 is uh, Teddy Roosevelt comes along, has his progressive party, the Bull Moose Party. Uh, he's going to st basically stand against uh, Taft, who was running for the Republicans, an incumbent. And the, uh, the ideas of a recumbent, or not recumbent, incumbent running uh, is usually a strong thing because it gets you, people that have won office tend to win it again. Uh, so the Republicans weren't going to, like, ditch him for Teddy Roosevelt. Um, also, you have the Socialist Party with old Eugene W. Debs, who's going to run on that ticket. Um, and the Democrats select a... They select the <coughs> governor of New Jersey, the former president of Princeton, and son of a minister, Woodrow Wilson. All right, Woodrow Wilson, sort of a stodgy kind of guy, very rigid, very uh, strong sense of duty... And, you know, that was kind of what pushed him, all right? Uh, it also sort of uh, alienates him with some people. Uh, and inside of his party, uh, to get the nomination, he got endorsed by the guy that had run subsequent times, William Jennings Bryan, and that kind of made him the popular candidate for the Democrats. Now, when the election rolls around, you have Taft and Roosevelt and Wilson and Debs, and they're all kind of against each other, but... What happens is, is Roosevelt and Taft kind of pull a Perot Bush against uh, Bill Clinton. And so Roosevelt takes just enough votes from Taft, or Taft takes just enough votes from Roosevelt to kind of cancel each other out. And so Wilson wins pretty easily uh, the presidency. Now, Wilsonian reform here, uh, he's going to have an, another tariff type thing where he's going to lower the duties on everything but it, the government's going to make money anyway because the 16th Amendment was passed somewhere in there, which is going to be the first time income tax is going to start to be taken. Also, Woodrow Wilson is going to pass the Federal Reserve Act. And you might remember um, the stuff in Devil in the White City where it's talking about these runs on banks and the sort of instability that the banking system was. So everyone had called for banking reform. Uh, you know, it wasn't since Andrew Jackson in 1830 had he killed the Second National Bank that they had anything like this come up. 
And so the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 was going to set up 12 federal districts, and each one would have a federal bank that would be basically owned by its member banks. And then there would be a Federal Reserve Board that oversaw it. So, you know, you might have heard of uh, ben Bernanke, the guy that today that's the head of the Federal Reserve Board, he sets interest rates. Uh, and so the Federal Reserve, one, helps fight the runs on banks because they can then sort of move currency from the Federal Reserve to the banks that are being, you know, withdrawn from heavily. Also, they can control the money supply more easier that way. They can fight inflation by changing interest rates and stimulate business by changing interest rates. So we'll get into that more down the road, but, you know, the whole... Uh, housing issue that the United States had a few years ago, the Federal Reserve had its own little part to play in that by lowering, having really low interest rates. Now, uh, also during this time period, you see more antitrust laws, uh, setting up a federal, the Federal Trade Commission in 1914, or the Federal Trade Commission Act in 1914, setting up the FTC. Federal Trade Commission is yet again going to be another oversight commission for uh, corporations much like the Bureau that Roosevelt had, but this one's going to have more strength. This is the commission today that things have to get vetted by if they're going to have mergers and stuff like that. So the recent merger of what was it, U.S. Airlines and American Airlines would have had to gone through the Federal Trade Commission to make sure that it was legitimate. Uh, Woodrow Wilson's also going to have a different view on the ideas of social justice than, say, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, what he's going to do is slightly different. You know, he's going to... Oh, that's unfortunate. I was hoping it would let me get to the bottom part there. Uh, what it's going to do is he's going to see it more of a state issue and not a national issue. So he's not going to be pushing it as quite a bit. Now, the next bullet is progressivism for, white only, for whites only. Um, and I think maybe that's on the next slide, too. Let me see. Well, it's on the limits of progressivism. But what happened is... Uh, the general feeling wasn't that, you know, equality and all the sort of progressive stuff we were talking about extended to African Americans. Uh, you know, what was going on was that, uh, you know, they were being disenfranchised in the South. Um, you know, there was xenophobia over immigrants, people coming into the United States that were different, we kind of fought that battle in class before. Um, uh, you know, look here. And one of the interesting things, I guess, coming out of this uh, is, you know, Woodrow Wilson himself was kind of racist. You know, he had written a paper in college where he said, uh, even though or, wait, he referred to as to African Americans as ignorant and inferior race and all those types of stuff. Uh, which doesn't really go along with it, the era, but that was more of one of those common things going on, is that, you know, racism was pretty prevalent in those places. Even though we had all that progress earlier, the whole separate but equal thing and the whole, you know, basically the outlook at the time, kind of people didn't care about it. Now, moving forward, you know, what's going to happen is, is that all that hope that the progressive era and the Gilded Age had for advancement is going to kind of be washed away and going to kind of be tempered with the encroaching World War I. Uh, I noticed on here I got the Federal Farm Loan Act. Uh, quick thing about that. Uh, Federal Farm Loan Act is going to be one of those progressive things that uh, Woodrow Wilson passes. It's going to lower prices for uh, farmers, and so I guess that should have been on the earlier slide. Sorry about that. Now, make sure you still go back and you read the whole chapter. You still have a quiz. Uh, and the, there's a lot of sort of trivia and minutia in there that I didn't really talk about. So make sure you get that information and I will see you guys in class.